not. explain a little here. Uh, okay. I have a pair of arrows here, and the most important difference between the arrows that you would shoot out of this bow and any old arrow is the knock preparation. You can see on the lighter colored arrow, the knock has a small horn insert. Okay, there's a, a, a horn insert set perpendicular to the knock. It goes in about a half an inch or more. That's glued in place very tightly with high glue. Then there's a binding of sinew. On the lighter colored arrow, that's a short binding. On the red arrow, that binding is almost four inches long. And this is a binding with extremely fine sinew wrapped very tight, soaked in glue, and the feathers are laid right over it. Now that is to protect that arrow from splitting under the impact of the string. You may notice that the knock is ground out a little bit farther too. It's a round tubular knock because these strings on these bows are very large diameter. They have to be. And so now you don't want, want your knock splitting. Twirl the light colored arrow around a little bit so they can see the knock on that. Yep. Yeah, because these, uh, the amount of force of that string coming against that, it just blow that into pieces and, you know, it drives through your arm. Yes, it's, it's very important to make a safe, strong knock for these bows. For these earls. Yes. You can see how that insert is set down completely into there. How, how far down does that insert go, Jeff? On the light colored arrow it goes in about a half inch. On the red arrow it goes in almost a full inch. Well you might not want a hundred pound bow and so designing the bow with the correct thickness and width is going to be very important. The effectiveness of the width is that if you double the width you will double the weight of the bow. If you double the thickness of the limb, you will make the weight of the bow go up by a factor of eight. So a very small increase in thickness is worth a very large increase in width. Now when you design your bow, you should make the ratio of the thickness of the sinew and wood and horn all about the same. Each should be about one-third of the thickness of the bow. I like to have a little more horn than sinew. Now I think you should probably shoot for an overall limb thickness of around 5 sixteenths all the way up to 7 sixteenths. 7 sixteenths is the thickness of the bow that we shot at 100 pounds. 5 sixteenths will give you a, a bow of maybe 50 to 60 pounds. And that's if you make the limbs about 1 and an eighth inch wide. 1 inch and plus 1 eighth. And uh, keep in mind that if you make the bow just slightly thicker, it's going to be a lot heavier. If you make it slightly wider, it will only be slightly heavier. What about uh, limb length limb and length. these measurements that you just gave thickness-wise? Yeah, keep in mind that these bows only bend in a very short section of the limb. So the limb length that we're talking about here is maybe 22 inches from tip to the handle maybe 24 inches. So if they were to make a longer bow, uh, they could proportionally make it thicker? I wouldn't make it thicker, I'd make it wider, because a slight increase in thickness makes a very heavy bow. Right. Jeff, you want to go ahead and grab those tools and mention real quick that I had commented throughout the tape often that Jeff had made this or invented this and whatnot. Well, he apparently hasn't done everything. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, a number of these tools are really of very ancient origin, and the only innovations that I've really made is, have been in redesigning a few and, and introducing a few more. This is something that I've been using to put bends in items, pieces of wood, and uh, I, I should not say that I've invented this, but it's a useful little device, and I wouldn't be surprised if they've been around for a long time. The scraping tool, the handle, very standard, used in Turkey for centuries. The only things that I've really introduced that are new is a guide for scraping and grooving surfaces and a movable hand clamp that can be clamped on the table. This is a useful device, cotton rope in here that stretches. This is a useful device for you to make. Uh, I would suggest that you go ahead and make one of these things. Very, very handy. Other than that, all of the tools that we've used, for the most part, 
our ancient Turkish or Chinese tools that have been around for a long, long time. All right, now we've fortunate on the bull that you built here, you there's one horn per limb. And one of the bows that we showed earlier had like seven splices in it. Right. Uh, why don't you explain a little about splicing the horn? Uh, if you okay. Mongolian bows in particular would have several pieces of horn in the limb, four pieces of goat horn spliced together. The proper way to splice the horn is by butting two pieces together because the horn is under a purely compressional load. And if you overlap these, they can slip under compression. They'll just slip over one another. If you fishtail joint these things together, that's a lot of work for achieving a, a joint that's not going to be any better than simply butting them together. So the proper way to splice horn end to end is to square the pieces very carefully and butt them together. And when the bow reflexes, it may pull that butt joint apart very slightly, and you should grind that joint out and put a small horn or ivory or bone spacer in there uh, to distribute that compressive load between the two limbs. What you're viewing here is a mistake not to make. It's an inversion of a bow. This, it was braced too low, and because of that, the string wrapped back around, the bow came back on itself. You can see where it's almost alive. Inverted. And it, it was because it was not braced high enough. This is an Egyptian angular bow. I'm impressed. And scared. I wonder why. I don't mean to do it. You know, I think I know why. It's still not braced high enough.